Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the plenary digital safety for journalists. My name is Ilze Jan Alksna. I'm an investigative journalist from Latvia. Before we start, uh, there are two uh, specific notes I should uh, introduce you. The one is a very practical matter. Someone misses um, phone, Samsung, Samsung mobile phone in a red color. If someone missing, then please contact uh, with the Latvian people. Somebody will be lucky to get his phone back. And the second uh, is a special note from UNESCO that um, there is a specific um, book called Building Digital Safety for Journalists, who is available also in internet. This uh, book um, is not uh, available here right now in this room, but uh, UNESCO people are um, happy, kindly ask you to look for it on internet. But if we can start, then probably I should um, a little bit introduce with myself. Probably the only reason I'm here is because my mobile phone conversations were tapped uh, by governmental institutions some years ago, and later on these conversations were leaked to mass media. Suddenly all my information sources were um, discovered. What I, uh, why I mentioned this example is because there are several professional questions in this digital world, and the one is how we can protect our information sources, uh, one from um, law enforcement authorities uh, as well as from uh, hacker attacks. And the second very important question is how can we fight against journalist reputation assassinations? because uh, trust is the only thing journalists have and uh, credibility is only our only asset. But I will use this opportunity, this big audience we have today, um, to um, tell you about uh, one concrete example. I would like to speak about journalist Khadija Ismailova. Investigative journalist um, is currently sitting in prison in Azerbaijan. Khadija was digging President Aliyev's family members' corruptive deals uh, recently, and um, state actors were trying to stop her many times, but Khadija was continuing her work. Khadija's trouble started um, when sex video uh, appeared online where she was together with her boyfriend. In such a conservative culture, as in Azerbaijan, that was something unacceptable. And there is just one simple question, what journalists in this situation can do? And I'm very happy to have here Mr. Peter Nolander from Media Legal Defense, non-governmental organization who is now also involved in Hadija's defense. Mr. Peter Nolander, please. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to come and um, speak on this panel about this. Um, and Khadija's case really is a, is a very strong example of how digital security is, it is totally linked with, with physical security. Um, and it is also a real microcosm of what tends to happen to journalists in repressive regimes uh, such as Azerbaijan. And make no mistake about it, Azerbaijan is an extremely repressive regime. Um, if I were to be sitting if we would have had this conference a year ago, in fact, there was this conference a year ago, World Press Freedom Day, there are always Azerbaijan, there were always Azerbaijani activists and journalists on the podium. There are none here today. They haven't been here any this weekend. Why? Because they have been imprisoned. Azerbaijan is an extremely re repressive state, and I'll come to some of the things that need to be done about that in a second. But I just wanted to really make that point because it does illustrate the situation that Khadija is in as well as the situation that other journalists in other countries like Azerbaijan is in. Um, so she was writing about um, extremely sensitive um, issues concerning the, the finances of the president and she was um, making allegations, very strong allegations of corruption and bribery and mismanagement of, um, of public funding. And the government tried a couple of things to stop that. First, they tried suing her for um, defamation and bringing other lawsuits against her for, for similar um, 
for similar alleged wrongdoings. They were unsuccessful in that because her writing was solid. She did extremely good research, she wrote good stories, and there was no way that even the law in Azerbaijan, which makes it very hard for journalists to defend themselves against these kinds of things, even in that context, her writing stood up, so the government couldn't do anything about that. Then they tried TAC2, which is a smear campaign. And as you said, they installed cameras in her house, they taped um, her private life over a period of, um, of a very long period, and they leaked some of the videos that were taped onto the internet. Um, that was accompanied by um, a, a really nasty campaign in the media, in the state-run media against her, um, really reinforcing or attempting to sort of paint this picture of her in the public eye of, of, of a journalist who was a tool of, um, um, of the West or of you know, anti-Azerbaijani forces um, and that she, was, that she was essentially not to be trusted. She stood up against that too. You know, many journalists would have at that point shrunk away, but no, she did the opposite. She went out and she said, I'm being violated in my rights, in my deepest, deepest privacy. And she, um, we appointed lawyers for her who took her case to the European Court of Human Rights last year, and that case is pending now, and we're expecting a, um, a result um, at, at some point this year. And I have no doubt that the European Court will find in her favor, because what the Azerbaijani government did to her was deeply nasty. Um, so with, anyway, so, so, so the government, having tried that second method of a smear campaign of destroying a reputation, found that that was failing too. And what they're now doing to her, and the reason that she's not here, is they've essentially made up criminal charges against her of tax evasion, of running illegal businesses. Um, and, the, and, and, and this is becoming, over the last six months or so, a tried and tested method for the Azerbaijani government to um, repressed journalists and civil society. They just make up stuff and they charge them with it. And for human rights defenders, this is actually something that is very difficult to defend because they're attacking her not um, in connection with things that she's written, they're making up charges against her. And um, we've had the first couple, well, we've had the first two um, convictions on similar cases of Azerbaijani um, human rights defenders, um, including a lawyer. And what we've seen is uh, sentences imposed of seven and a half and eight and a half years. Um, and what we've seen is a relatively weak reaction by, um, um, by international community, particularly from within Europe. The Council of Europe and the European Union have expressed um, concern about the severity of the sentence and they've called for an appeal. But in a situation like that, what you don't need is an appeal. You get an appeal before judges that aren't independent. What you need is the immediate release, and what you need is not a, 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 an expression of concern about the severity of the sentence. You need a strong condemnation. And I'm saying that because we're essentially up against the limit of what we, as lawyers and as civil society activists, can, can achieve in a case like hers. We need not just sharp lawyers on the case, you know, we, we've got that, we're trying our hardest, but we need strong, con strong condemnation from the international political community. So I'm, I'm, I'm slightly abusing my position here to make that pitch, but it is an extremely, pitch to, uh, extremely important pitch that needs to be made. And I'm making it not just for Khadija, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it because, as I said, her case is a microcosm of what, exp what happens to journalists in similar countries around the world. Have been then recently the same assassination uh, cases to the human rights defender, also attacks in the um, Arab world. Uh, we have here, ladies and gentlemen, human rights defender Ms. Mariam Al Khavaja. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and being on this distinguished panel. Um, I wanted to share with you today some of the issues that um, civilian journalists or online journalists face these days and the harassment and defamation campaigns that they go through, uh, some of which Peter has already alluded to in his talk about Azerbaijan, but are very similar tactics to what we're seeing in the Middle East and North Africa as well. Um, in the Gulf Center, we work on 10 different countries that we cover. And we've seen many of these tools uh, being used around the different countries that we cover, um, especially when it comes to journalists and people who write online. What we saw in places like Bahrain and Syria 
is the government learning that shutting down the internet um, doesn't work, as we saw in Egypt, but rather they learn to use the internet as a tool uh, of repression, of going after people who write about what's going on in the country. And for human rights defenders, uh, they have become on the front line of these issues because, yes, they're human rights defenders and they're working on human rights issues, but they're also covering events especially in places like Bahrain, where the majority of the media is run and owned by the government. Um, suddenly the human rights defenders were the people who were talking about what's going on on the ground and actually became sources of information for uh, mainstream media covering the issues on the ground. And what we've seen time and time again in, in Bahrain and other places is defamation campaigns where the government does everything they can to go after uh, the person who's writing um, about the situation in the country by using different, you know, accusing them of being uh, either agents of different countries or accusing them of things that they think will not be socially acceptable and thus trying to make them social outcasts. Uh, in Bahrain specifically, we've seen the government using the threat du jour to go after different activists. So for example, uh, in the beginning it was that all activists, you know, were Iranian agents, that they were all working for Iran and so they were very biased in what they were saying in their coverage. Um, when Saudi Arabia and Bahrain no longer liked Qatar very much because of a diplomatic spat, suddenly we were being funded by Qatar, uh, and that's why we were writing what we were writing. And so these different kind of defamation campaigns. But it didn't stop there. The defamation campaigns and the threats online go far beyond just trying to paint people who use online activism and online journalism as a, as a form or a tool of writing about the situation. Um, we saw threats of death, of rape, of violence uh, happening towards people who were using online forums uh, to speak about the situation on the ground. Um, but then also using uh, spyware that the government would buy to locate people who were using Twitter anonymously, for example, uh, to talk about the situation on the ground and then to arrest them. Um, my, I myself have been subjected to different defamation campaigns. Uh, if you go online and type in my name on Google, you'll see all types of things, uh, accusing me of working for four or five different governments uh, around the world. Some of them don't make any sense. Like, for example, I work for Iran and the CIA and the Mossad all at the same time. Um, which is, uh, I must say, I mean, I think I'm the only person in the world who can bring those three together. Um, but then also things like, they'll spread a picture of me standing next to a man and say, look, she's not a good Muslim. She's standing next to a man in this, what appears to be an apartment. And they'll draw, you know, my hand around his waist, for example, and then say, look, she's not a good Muslim. You can't, you can't think to support someone like her. Um, or there's even videos. There are very, very well-made videos that you can see were produced very professionally that actually attack people uh, like myself and other activists in Bahrain saying all kinds of things like, for example, we're anti-women's rights, uh, so we call for violence against women, or we're anti-immigrant rights uh, in the country. And so they'll try to use all these type of different methods to defame activists and make them uh, outside of the social scope so that people stop supporting them or to take away their credibility. Now with Bahrain's situation, it's been quite difficult for the government to do that. Um, and for many different reasons, and one of them being that Bahraini human rights activists have worked together and defended activists in both places like Iran and in Syria, and so they can't paint Russia as, as being Iranian agents. Uh, but in other places it has worked. When we look at places like uh, Egypt, for example, or Syria, or otherwise, where, where Syrian activists or journalists are painted as working for the Mossad or the CIA, it does become an issue sometimes, and at different levels it can sometimes even become life-threatening. And so these are, these are definitely, I mean, social media and the internet has been a great tool in the hands of activists and uh, citizen journalists, but it has also become a tool in the hands of the regimes, who then use that as a way of going after uh, activists and uh, citizen journalists. And I'll end on this. Uh, one of the other things that are also similar to what Peter was mentioning about uh, Azerbaijan is in Bahrain, they also try to use some of the similar methods of you do not legally go after activists by using something that will obviously be linked to their human rights work or their citizen journalism. And so, for example, I myself went back to Bahrain last year uh, to visit my father in prison who's on, who was on hunger strike. And I was st stopped at the airport, beaten by the police, and then arrested and thrown in prison for three weeks. And then the same policewoman who, who had abused me and had used force against me then accused me of uh, attacking them. And I was sentenced in December to one year in prison for attacking police. Uh, 
Now again, this idea of, no, 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 this has nothing to do with her human rights activism or speaking out about, about the situation in Bahrain. This is about her attacking police officers. And so, and they even use sentences like, well, the law has to apply to everyone. You can't expect us to say that human rights defenders should be the exception and not have the law applied to them when they commit crimes, even though, of course, there are medical reports that prove that I was the victim, not the offender. And so we see a lot of these methodologies being used uh, and reciprocated in different countries, um, but they're pretty much the same tools that are used by the governments. Thank you, but what was the, I have a, the, one more question, what was the best help you got um, for this situation? How to fight with this false uh, abuses and, and etc. What was the best help you received because you also were in prison for a while? Well, I think um, my case is a rare success story um, because it was actually the international pressure that was built around my case that that then secured my release and my exiting from the country. I can no longer go back to Bahrain because I've been sentenced or to any country that has a security agreement with Bahrain since there's a warrant for my arrest. But my case is one of the only cases in Bahrain we've seen where international pressure worked because it happened. Um, and for me, it was both a success but also a failure because it was a success because I was able to get out of prison and leave the country and continue to do my work. It was a failure because the attention and the pressure that was created around my own case was the same attention and pressure that I was trying to create around other cases in Bahrain and unfortunately did not happen. And those people are still in prison today. They've been in prison for many years and they will be in prison for many more years because unfortunately they're not high profile cases like myself. And so I think this is where it becomes tricky is, yes, this is a success story, and yes, it should be applauded, but at the same time, we need to cre be able to create the same kind of pressure and the same kind of attention for those who remain faceless and, un and, and voiceless and nameless um, in prisons. That's exactly my point. Among the speakers today, we are happy to have journalists from Ukraine, Anastasia Stanko, co-founder of Khromatsk Television. Since it is war going on in Ukraine and uh, massive propaganda is running in uh, Russian media, we actually know a little about the daily journalist work in Ukraine. Ms. Stanko, could you retell what are the, the main threats for digital safety in Ukraine? Thank you. My name is Nastya. Uh, yeah, I am a journalist from Ukraine from, of Hromatska TV. Uh, I just, uh, my English is not so good, but I will try. I will, I will try to speak from my heart, as everyone say. Uh, okay, Hromatska is uh, uh, independent public uh, online television, and it's founded by political and, and investigative journalists and uh, financed by um, by audience, financed by also uh, international organizations, and that's why we are um, um, that's, that's why we are independent from politicals, from all Ukrainian politicals, and from business, and it's good. <laughs> uh, but um, and. Uh, uh, we, begin, uh, we began uh, before the uh, Euromaidan revolution uh, and uh, 2013, uh, and um, uh, we, can, uh, we came known um, because of uh, this uh, live streaming uh, coverage uh, story from from the streets of the capital of Ukraine and Kiev. And now uh, we are uh, making many reports from the eastern part of Ukraine, where is now uh, a war, uh, from also. Uh, Crimea annexed, uh, and uh, I work there at all, at, as, as well, sorry. Uh, and before I start, I should explain uh, the situation in the media, uh, with the media in uh, Ukraine. Um, we are chased during the Maidan by a former regime, but later uh, there is uh, less pressure from the government. Uh, while many uh, journalists were, uh, had attacked in the Crimea and later in the Donbass, um, more than 80 journalists, uh, uh, and uh, including me, were uh, detained by the separatists uh, on Donbass and uh, in Odessa. Seven were killed. Dunya Matuj said about that uh, today also. Uh, and uh, more than 260 um, were beaten. Uh, 
uh, it's during the 2014. Uh, and now it's very hard to work on the occupation area, uh, especially if you have Ukrainian passport. But we are trying to do this. And if we're speak, speaking about cybersecurity, uh, for example, uh, being, being an influential, influential media Hromadske service, we attacked many, many times during the uh, Maidan revolution and after that. But uh, uh, we are like, like low-cost company. Yeah? We, are, you know, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, and it's very uh, hard uh, to crash us in, in the YouTube. And also, uh, during the Maidan revolution, we used uh, Ustream, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Skype uh, to go on. And it was hard uh, to the regime to, to uh, do something with us. Uh, and, um, but, but yeah, there are many concerns uh, connected to that. Uh, 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 cybersecurity cannot be separated from physical security, and uh, I explain. Social networks, uh, uh, separatists or agents, Russian agents, uh, uh, would follow what you are writing, for example. And when I was detained uh, in Luhansk region by Luhansk, so-called Luhansk People Republic, uh, they, uh, they could check not just my profiles, but what my colleagues are writing at that time. And uh, uh, it uh, can put your uh, life at risk, you understand? And it was with me, for example. And we can, uh, we can have so many passwords, but, you know, uh, it was such a funny story with my colleague. Uh, she is now here, too. Um, um, Russian propaganda, uh, one, uh, the biggest state TV channel, Russian, uh, they made the report about uh, some, some so-called organization, Kiber Berkut, uh, crashed the account, like, like crashed the account, and uh, like she wrote the email to uh, one uh, Ukrainian MP about uh, what to do with uh, people in Donbass area, in this occupation area, that they are uh, not uh, normal people, and so on and so on. But it was like fake story. Uh, email wasn't crashed. Uh, she don't wrote uh, this letter to the MP, never. And she uh, never says something like that. And why, why, why passport? Why passport? Why some other security? If you can uh, like wrote fake story, write fake story, and um, it's uh, every time happened with us uh, with Russian propaganda. We have and uh, and we have um, such an organization. One program. It's called Stop Fake uh, Org, and. They have one weekly program, and they have everyday topics for uh, f to to, uh, to make news uh, to um, to stop this this fake, you know, to to write this is fake, this is fake, every day fake from Russia, every day, every time, and it's it's like solution what to do, but briefly. Thank you. Maybe this is a time to give a floor to Courtney Raj. Uh, she is representing committee to protect journalists. Uh, Ms. Courtney Raj, what could be done for these situations like in Ukraine? What could be uh, done for a safer digital safety for journalists' work? Uh, you got a broader landscape about the situation right now for nowadays and what can be done in these situations when someone can, uh, you know, <laughs> needs your, 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 your password and, and network uh, profile and etc. So I think first of all it's um, creating this culture of safety and I love that almost I think everybody on the panel has said that there is no difference between physical and digital security. They are implicated in each other and I think everyone realizes we can't really separate these two things. Um, and I think that we have to look at the broader dynamics that are happening where in the past we've had some governments that are able, you know, we're able to turn to as our, you know, partners in the fight for press freedom and we can um, call on their normative power. But the landscape has not only shifted in terms of um, the digital landscape but also in terms of the normative landscape. So whereas once journalists really, um, I think for the most part in most regions with exceptions for China and Iran and Tunisia and some of the other very repressive countries, were a bit ahead 
of others in their use of, of social media and digital media, and that is no longer the case. It is an arms race, which means that journalists now, because everyone is using the internet and digital media and mobile phones to do their reporting, to do their dissemination, has to think about digital security. They have to think about encryption, surveillance, um, reputational management, et cetera, which means that that is taking away time and money and resources that could be spent on something else, for example. So instead of, um, as one of my colleagues pointed out in a recent book we just put out, you know, instead of now spending money maybe on a new uh, camera or on training for staff, they have to invest in you know, the latest security upgrades or, uh, or security solutions, which means that it's a diversion of resources. And on the parallel to this is now, you know, these revelations about mass surveillance by Western governments, by the United States and by the UK, as well as targeted surveillance of journalists in terms of obtaining phone records from uh, media outlets, in terms of the UK's use of the REPA Act to um, surveil journalists and get their records. Um, and, I mean, it's also funny they went into, you know, The Guardian and, and destroyed their computers as if they wouldn't have made a backup, but like hopefully, you know, those journalists knew how this works. So um, now that has, dis, you know, really diminished the normative power of those countries to hold other states accountable so that when Egypt reveals that well, it did not reveal, Citizen Lab revealed a tender uh, for a massive surveillance system that would allow, essentially, journalists would have no ability to communicate with their sources securely, um, as well as anyone else. It means that, you know, they're no longer in a position to speak out against that very strongly. Um, and I think that what we have to take is a holistic approach, because, you know, mass surveillance, as well as the targeted surveillance of journalists, undermines press freedom broadly, not only because journalists can't communicate with their sources securely, but then people don't feel that they can communicate with journalists securely. And I think that we also have to look broadly at attacks and the type of cyber attacks that we're seeing because whereas in the past it was, you know, phishing and, and we still see a lot of phishing, you know, you get a link, you get an attachment. I think most people know that like that Nigerian prince that sent you that email or, you know, whatever it was about the, you know, you, your UK friend who got stranded on a desert island, like probably not real. Um, now it's much more sophisticated, and so we see that you have commercial spy software that's available in some of the most repressive countries in the world. So like FinFisher, um, which was used in Bahrain, for example, monitors citizens in at least 20 other countries, according to Citizen Lab, and it's been used to spy on journalists and activists in Iran and Bahrain um, and Egypt and elsewhere. And these are Western countries who are uh, companies who are benefiting from the context of the Western companies in which they in which they operate. And I think we see that it's becoming more insidious, the types of attacks. So there are new attacks like network injection appliances, which again my colleague has written about recently, which have been deployed in Oman and Turkmenistan, which inserts malicious software into what would otherwise be very innocuous traffic. And you know as a journalist, um, I used to work at Al Arabiya, and I remember there were sites, like we couldn't access whole domains like .il. So if I was ever doing a story on Israel, I couldn't like access an Israeli news site. Um, you know, so that sort of blocking, I think they've gotten beyond that. But journalists, you have to go all over the web. You have to find your information. So you're going to all sorts of sites, you're watching videos, and now these network injection appliances are putting web browsing, are making web browsing dangerous. And we see also how hacking has become a form of censorship. So we see how non-state actors, just as bad as governments here, people, ISIS, the Syrian Electronic Army, and others have hacked the websites and social media accounts in order to either post their own messages or control the narrative. Um, it re they restrict access to normal content and, and information. And of course, they use DDoS attacks, which can remove not only individual news sites, like this poor Russian journalist I was talking to today, who's like, oh, we deal with DDoS attacks every day. We've got it under control. And it's like, this is now part of what they have to deal with on a regular basis. But now, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw that um, these were able to take off an entire system offline when TV5 and, um, and Le Soir were attacked and their, their websites as well as their email systems and their internal communication systems, multiple news organizations taken offline by these attacks. 
And we see things like China's great cannon. So everyone's probably heard of the great firewall. Well, now there's a cannon to go over that firewall and attack um, outside through content or link destinations. And again, journalists who are out there surfing for information are very susceptible to, um, as is everybody, um, to, to clicking on these sort of links and you just will never even know that you've been attacked. And so I think responding to these sort of things, it takes skills, it takes time, it takes money, and it diverts resources. And I think also, you know, as the, these stories have illustrated, you know, anti-surveillance um, and privacy tools are only useful for half of the equation because the other half are the public attacks and you can't not be public if you're a journalist. Um, and I think there's also a gender dimension to that. Miriam, you know, alluded to that, but in, you know, in my research in the Arab region, which uh, Miriam was one of the people I interviewed, you know, looking at the, the way that women particularly are attacked online, their reputations destroyed, um, and that can be very difficult to overcome. And that, we're also seeing that in the U.S., for example, and I think we have to be very careful that in our responses to all of these challenges, whether it's developing anti-terrorism policies to counter the very real threat of terrorism, that we don't use anti-terrorism policies as an opportunity to restrict dissent and criticism. And the same with the whole counter ter countering violent extremism movement that's happening now, you know, where that is about countering extremist propaganda, but in many cases it involves governments funding or promoting their own content. So we have to be very careful there. And again, that countering extremism isn't used as a way to counter dissent. So, you know, it's, it's a real balancing act. And I think that, um, you know, I'd love to hear the last story about Uganda. Just one more question. Uh, why women have been attacked more than, than men? I wouldn't say more, but I think they're susceptible to a type of attack that is based on sexuality in a way that most men are not. I think LGBT people as well face those sort of threats, but I have seen definitely in the Arab region because there are these cultural norms, as Miriam suggested, but also again, like in the US, there are journalists who have said, you know, I have literally quit journalism um, because they just can't stand the attacks on their reputation um, and, and, and the threats of rape and sexual assault online. Unfortunately, it did happen in Eastern Europe too. But let's move to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We got a researcher and journalist um, from CPESA, Bahragala Vakabi. Uh, you wrote me first that um, they were the years where digital uh, technologies were safe space for uh, communication, but it has changed. Why and how? Thank you. Um, a bit of context. Um, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we have 20% of the people accessing the internet and 69% uh, uh, penetration of the mobile phones. Okay? In other words, 69 telephone connections for every 100 individuals. Those numbers are few, but uh, the people who use the technologies tend to be influencers. And so it has become uh, um, interesting to governments to, 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 to keep an eye on what is happening in the online spaces. And I think there are many things which have influenced why this happened. Um, one of them is uh, um, the Arab Spring uprisings. They, they sort of uh, uh, created in, uh, a suspicion among some of the governments in sub-Saharan Africa that something similar might, might happen. And there were a few attempts which never really got fly in some places. Um, the, 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 the other thing, of course, is that uh, there is in many African countries a problem of uh, hate speech. And it, is, it manifests itself very much in the online sphere. And there have been some uh, fairly legitimate attempts at controlling it. Uh, similarly, there have been uh, um, attempts at controlling terrorism, for instance. Um, so this has also been a, um, a cause for, for some of this change. The problem is that some of these laws, in as, uh, well, they may come up to address these issues that may be considered legitimate, 
they actually do not always end up uh, um, addressing those issues, but target legitimate uh, expression. And so we are seeing in a number of countries that uh, um, I think many of us are aware with the situation in Ethiopia, for instance, where the government is able to, to deploy uh, malware. This has, has happened to, to so many human rights defenders, including those that are living outside of the country, such as in the US. We have also seen uh, action against bloggers, such as the Zone 9 bloggers in, in Ethiopia, who are actually, uh, up to now, for the last one year, in prison over their online uh, um, um, activism. But we are also seeing in very many other places, government simply uh, blocking access, access to websites, which happens quite readily in Rwanda, or oh, we are seeing uh, uh, government ordering newspapers and other online publishers not to publish because they have committed a certain offense in countries like Burundi and Tanzania where they are ordered not to, 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 to accept any reader's comments or not to actually um, publish anything. Now, the, the sum total of this is that uh, we, we have a very big fear factor in many of the sub-Saharan African countries. Namely, people have a perception that there is a lot of surveillance and monitoring of their online communications, which in some cases is actually not the case. But what it has added up to is that people are not uh, ordinary citizens, in many cases, are not able to express themselves on certain issues uh, the way they would. When they do, they do it anonymously. So the, the media also then is not able to reach out to many of its sources or to take advantage of the user-generated content and pick tips from online mediums. And the media itself, of course, they, uh, they, in many countries, there is a lot of self-censorship. Almost every journalist I talk to, they tell me there are some taboo topics. They are not going to comment to online not just in their um, actual um, of, of, offline mediums, because they fear that they are going to be reprisals from what, what they say. Um, I think one of the, the, the things um, which, which have also prompted that is that uh, African governments take interest in this, uh, what we perceive big online, is that um, if somebody says, something in, uh, on a vernacular radio station in Malawi or writes in a vernacular radio station in uh, Kenya in a vernacular newspaper, the world most likely is not going to see that they are criticizing the government and unearthing the bad things that are happening in that country. But once this is on online, then everybody in the world is going to see, including uh, the government's friends overseas who are always telling them to either act up in terms of good gov gov government governance or lose their support. Uh, so there is quite a bit of sensitivity on, to what happens online as opposed to what might happen with a, a fairly less consequential medium such as a small vernacular newspaper. Thank you, Mr. Vairagalab from Uganda. We were supposed to have the second round, but um, the start it was so interesting that we are a little bit out of time. And I think that this is a time for questions and comments from the audience. We are very kindly asking you to have your comments and questions, please. Hi, my question goes to uh, source protection. My name is Julie Pizzetti. I've just finished a um, study for uh, UNESCO on, on behalf of Wanifra and interviewed, well, some of the researchers interviewed Peter and Courtney, so uh, hopefully we'll have some useful responses. But I'm wondering what everything you've said here <laughs> collectively in terms of surveillance and spyware and risk and threat, um, and a couple of you alluded to the sorts of exposure that can come 
to your data as a result of, um, of such uh, acts by states and non-state actors. What are the implications for protecting your sources? Um, it, how important is that as, as an element of your, your journalism, especially your investigative journalism? And how do you think um, organisations, uh, media and, and state, NGOs and others should respond? Um, so I think, first of all, um, that study, I, as far as I know, is kind of uh, came out of an earlier study on world trends and freedom of expression and media development, which I edited while at UNESCO. And one of the things that we found was that, A, there had only been one like comprehensive study on source protection laws, and I think it covered like 30 countries, and it was from 2007. So it was very clear that there is not, there are very few, if any, legal frameworks for source protection. So um, it'll be interesting to see whether governments, you know, have put those in place. I would say unlikely. I don't think so. Um, but I think that it does focus on the need for journalists to take control of protecting their sources. But there is, I think, this feeling out there that it's almost impossible, so why bother? And I think we can't do that, and that's why I go back to what I said at the beginning, which is creating a culture of security and safety. Um, and part of that is on media organizations also to provide the tools easily to their staff, and frankly to NGOs would be great as well. You know, embed that encryption software in the computers that you give staff, um, include that training that they get. And I wanna say that there are, um, there's Secure Drop, which is a secure and anonymous submission system for journalists that, is, that takes both the media organization and the journalist and the source out of, like they have no ability um, to be able to respond. But I think also related to source protection is problematic efforts by the US government and the UK government to say that we shouldn't you know, that the, that the government should have a backdoor into encryption standards, and that is problematic. And so I hope we don't, um, you know, see more, more words about that. Okay, I totally agree with all of that. I, I would add that the, one of the problems with surveillance and source protection, I mean, the surveillance is obviously completely undermines the source protection. I think that is, that is clear to everybody here. But the, the problem with the legal frameworks is that they're rooted in thinking from the 80s and 90s, when um, people thought that, look, if somebody, you know, if somebody actually intercepts the content of a phone call or the content of an email, then that is deeply intrusive because you can listen to or read what people are saying. But it's not so intrusive if you just get the traffic data, the communications data. And I think what we've now learned is that actually getting the communicator data is as intrusive and as threatening to source protection um, as the rest. And that awareness wasn't there when these laws went through um, the various parliaments in the UK and in the US and elsewhere. So what we need to do is two things. We need journalists to challenge these laws, and that is now beginning to happen. There are some cases at the European Court of Human Rights um, challenging these laws as, 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 as clear um, interfering violations of the right to freedom of expression. But secondly, civil society needs to campaign, as it is already doing, for these, for these laws to be completely overhauled. And in the meantime, all journalists need to be aware that they're not safe, and they need to go you know, back to basics sometimes when it comes to uh, communicating with their sources. Um, I think one, one point that um, I haven't really heard that I think is also important to bring up is the fact that you're only as protected and as secure as the person that you're talking to. I mean, you can be completely trained uh, in internet security and use all of the apps and all of the mediums of self-protection, but if your source or the person that you're talking to doesn't have the same level of security that you have, then you're both vulnerable. And I think that that's one of the things that needs to be said over and over again. It's not just important to train the journalists and the staff at the media organization. You need to make sure that your fixer and your sources on the ground also know how to use that technology. Because if they don't, then you're not secure and neither are they. Yeah, but how can you can encourage the whistleblowers then if they see that such kind of uh, journalist phone conversation tapping is going on? How can we can encourage them? I mean, there, I think there are different methodologies. If, if people know what the consequences are, I think they're going to want to protect themselves. Um, and that is the case in most, in most places where people are at threat of arrest or torture or even, even death. Um, so there are different ways to go around it. I mean, one of the things that human rights NGOs are trying to do more and more uh, often now is to make sure that when they're talking to people on the ground, they first talk to them about how to protect themselves. So they tell them, okay, we would like to talk to you, but please, can you install this and make sure that you use this so that you're encrypted? 
Um, and like Peter was saying, yes, the government will be able to see the traffic, but they won't be able to see what's in the conversation. And sometimes that's also important. Now, of course, it depends, and not all the situations are the same, because sometimes the traffic alone is enough to get you picked up and, and um, you know, interrogated. But sometimes what's also said in the traffic is also very important. So there's different ways to do it, and I think, especially for people who have worked on the ground, I mean, I know human rights defenders and activists who are just not bothered with doing it because they feel like they're going to be tracked anyway, they're going to be, you know, uh, have spyware on their devices anyway, so they're not bothered to do it. But I think what's important to remind people of, including the sources and the fixers, is that you're putting not just yourself at risk, but also those you're talking to. And I mean, some very, yeah, just very practical. I mean, companies can implement HTTPS encryption by default, or HTTPS instead of HTTP, so the traffic is encrypted. You know, you, there are, there's an initiative called Ranking Digital Rights, which is looking at the role private companies are going to take and ranking them on that. And I think, again, going to this culture of security, all actors, governments, non-state actors, companies, activists have a role to play, and you have to create a culture. So again, Secure Drop is a good way to get information, and then no one knows, and you can't even subpoena that person because the person doesn't know where they got it from. Yeah, I wanted to add uh, one thing. Um, many times we see that um, campaigns to create security for journalists normally target journalists, but do not go beyond the individuals, the organizations. That's a problem that needs to be addressed. In Uganda, a few, a few years ago, I think three, the government occupied the offices of uh, the major independent newspaper for some time. They carried the, with the, the computers and were able to access emails of the editors, including their strategies on how to cover the government, including how they were fighting among each other. So I think uh, the point here is that we should, uh, and when they got those emails, of course, they, they, they gave them out and published them. So the, the point here is that we should emphasize very much at the company level, uh, a, a, a culture of, of uh, security for the company. Yes, Anastasia, you wouldn't, wanted to add something. Uh, I, I actually agree with my colleague that uh, it's not about uh, safety, about uh, only about journalists, uh, but about citizen journalists, also about freelancers. Uh, we have such situation in the Crimea, which is uh, occupied and in the occupied and bus area. Uh, we don't say who uh, give us information while we take this information because it's it can be danger to these people who live who live there. Yeah, and but but we, we don't say how how we, we do this. So the, the, the one is clear, journalism can't move forward without anonymity. That's, that's clear. Another question from the audience, please. Okay. Uh, it's not a question, actually, just continuing what Mariam was, uh, was starting. Um, in, in, uh, in Syria, some, uh, some uh, people, different parties actually used uh, Actually, both parties used in Facebook uh, um, different identities uh, to, to be in communications. And, and sometimes it was just like um, after a lot of talking, give appointment, and then the one get arrested or arrested or kidnapped or something. So it's, it's also like use it to, to have this fake identity. And we should be uh, taking care of this. But I think generally, like at the end, it's a huge risk, you know. Uh, also in Syria, um, there was um, this using for uh, the uh, phone signs uh, that control to know where the media center, and that's what actually happened in um, the media center in Baba Amr Homs 2012, and then we, we the, the military attacked. Uh, uh, accused to the death of Remy Oshlik and Mary Colvin. And people get very, very uh, uh, trying to be careful when they are using the modern mobile phones, you know? Because I think it's very, it could be for both, uh, both faces and we should be very careful when we are using the uh, modern technology. Uh, personally, I don't believe there's any kind of privacy because you know, WikiLeaks has ad, uh, admitted like some of, of uh, documents they have by uh, Chinese hackers who attacked a tour, 
and and that's the tool you know that's supposed to protect everything so uh, but I think social media truly could be very effective and useful and 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 make a high awareness in in, in, in a media campaign as as uh, Maryam said to to light on on uh, a free of expression detentions or, or uh, cases in that level more than use it in in daily process work because then I think the dangers would be more high. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are two guys, one in the middle, yes please. Yeah, hello, my name is Yuris Kaja. I'm a, a journalist. I work mainly for the Wall Street Journal. I also write a lot of uh, my own views on things on Facebook and, and, and so forth. So uh, pulling these two, two issues together, um, I mainly worked almost exclusively with open, open sources. I've never had any, any, any trouble like, like uh, some of you up on the stage have mentioned. Uh, I once got called up by Latvian military counterintelligence who said I had revealed state secrets and then I pointed them to a website that was run by the German company Siemens listing the kind of equipment that they sell to, uh, for border security. And I said, well, you know, it's not me, it's them that have breached state security, so why don't you go do something to yourself, you know. <laughs> I didn't put it that, 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 that bluntly. Um, but my question is, first of all, are there websites or places where you have a updated kit for cybersecurity that you can go and say, okay, this, this is this set of tools that I need to keep my own accounts safe and to keep my source, source materials that I've gathered safe and that gets updated in, 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 in pace with the way uh, the other side is developing its surveillance tools. So if, if you can sort of give a, give a hint as to where we can go there. Um, as far as uh, reputational security, fortunately, uh, the people that have attacked me for my rather libertarian views on a couple of issues uh, have sort of discredited themselves by, by virtue of their own insanity. So that has not been an issue for me. But I can understand how if people come out and say, look, you know, you're or in a different culture say that you are a, an indecent woman or an immoral man or whatever, that, that that could be very harmful and it's very difficult to defend against if you don't go back and you know, point these people out for what they are, you know, which are lunazoids, new word that I made up. Um, and uh, you know, in my case, uh, I, I, have, I, I think I've been fairly successful in simply just fending off people on Facebook who, who called me in the same breath, a Satanist and a Marxist, so. So I can address some, uh, the resource question, but first, I mean, that whole thing about I've never been contacted by an anonymous source is exactly why we need a culture of security. Because if the only people who are using encryption are the people reporting on national security or reporting on issues where those sources need that vast protection, then it's almost like a, a big radar, like, hey, look at me, try to get me, right? So when you create a culture of security where even you, if you're a fashion reporter or you're a sports reporter or you're you know, a weather reporter, everybody is using these tools and they're integrated and it's just, again, part of this culture, then it's much harder to pinpoint. I mean, I think if, it, if I'm, I know in the past, I don't know if it's still the case in Pakistan, but they outlawed encryption um, so but if everybody uses it then you know you're safer and in terms of tools I mean um, CPJ has a journalist security guide which has a digital component internews I want to say has um, a guide with includes some like open source um, collaborative development um, I think IREX has a guide there are lots of security guides out there um, they're pretty easy to find online and they're available in multiple languages um, I don't know if anyone has yeah. Can I, if I can just add, there's also, I mean, the ones that we use the most in the human rights organizations, you have security in a box uh, that you can f find online uh, from human rights, uh, sorry, frontline defenders. And then there's also EFF. They do a lot of good work on how to protect yourself online. They even do app comparisons where you can see which apps are safer and why. Uh, so they actually try to explain to you why so stuff works and why stuff doesn't work. Um, you know, uh, Oh, you want 
You know, this is a serious problem for Ukraine because, uh, for example, you can uh, make a very good article with, uh, with all the uh, sites, yeah, about objective, everything is okay. But, for example, you posted this in Twitter or in Facebook and comments, comments, comments. We have, like, army of trolls, uh, Russian trolls, yeah. I, I, I know that thousand people walked there like trolls and they command 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 and audience they they don't uh, they don't see the difference between article between the job of the journalist and about some uh, trolls commands they say many many comments you, you maybe you hear this story about crash of mh17 boeing uh, on the eastern part of ukraine with 298 uh, people on the board and uh, I don't remember maybe five ten minutes and it were it were many different ideas why it was happened and it was like theory that uh, uh, it were already dead uh, people on the board before crashed and, and other and other and this is like informational noise you say it was such and such and such way, but commands, 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 many, many, many people and uh, audience uh, think, oh, maybe this is true, or maybe this is true. And it, the this only is possibility true. is just to make an article about the trolls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we make this, but. Yes, the question from the audience, that the guy with the orange chief. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Dejan Georgievsky and I come from a country in which we have a joke that if you want to write an email to the chief of intelligence services, you just write an email. Uh, so, you know, basically uh, some people will guess I come from Macedonia, which is now involved in one of the, I would say, uh, compared by scale, the, the, one of the worst wiretapping scandals in the history of the, of the planet. Apparently, our, our government and intelligence services has, uh, have wiretapped over the period of six years, maybe 25,000 people, which is 1.5% of the total population of Macedonia, including a number of journalists, usually critical, opposition journalists and investigative journalists. And it has had negative consequences uh, for their reporting because if they listen that you are talking to a possible source, someone from the government will go in and make a friendly suggestion that you should stop speaking to this and or that journalist. Uh, and uh, also we have had in terms of, you know, reputation attacks and everything, uh, Peter Norlander, with whom we work a lot, uh, our organization certainly knows how uh, defamation laws are used and abused by, especially by the government, uh, through control of the judiciary. So basically you, you cannot write anything that is critical of the government. You can write about major corporations, basically. You, uh, there is no fear to attack major corporations, even international ones, but if you write something about government official, you are pretty sure that you will, you will get, uh, you know, basically, you will fork out a huge uh, punitive damages. Uh, and also, uh, we have, and this is the most uh, worrisome, we have had cases of journalists basically smearing other journalists, usually male chauvinist pigs smearing their female colleagues, investigative journalists, uh, as someone mentioned, uh, basically on sexual grounds, uh, LGBT persons are smeared. So that is, I, I don't have a question, I just wanted to complain to such a great auditorium. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your courage. Uh, another question maybe. Yeah, down there. Okay, hey everyone. I'm uh, Mayu. I work for the Finnish Foundation for Media and Development. So I come from Finland. And my question is maybe to, directed to Peter, especially. Um, when we think about internet, when it was first founded, uh, the thought was that it would be a place for open discussion and uh, safe haven for every one of us. 
Um, but can we as individuals or journalists or even national governments, can we do anything about this mass data collection that is done by huge international companies who mostly work in the states? And for example, if we do a law that forbids surveillance in Finland, but all the, all the information is going to Facebook, to the states, it, it doesn't really matter what, what law we have in Finland. So what do you think, like, what can we actually do? And um, is it then the job of the citizens to demand back this uh, idea of the internet as, is, as it used to be? I mean, I think there's, there's two different things, right? And, and, but it's about surveillance by governments and it's about surveillance by companies. But at the root of solving both of those problems is awareness. And, you know, people, individuals, just need to be aware of what it is that they're potentially sharing. So if you're going to go on Facebook, you know, look at your privacy settings and make sure that, you, that, that they are as high as you want them to be. Or if you're a total exhibitionist, as low as you want them to be. But, you know, the, the, the basic issue is, is about awareness. You can vote with your feet, you know, you can choose not to be on Facebook. Revolutionary, I know, but, but it is actually pro possible. And, but the same awareness also has to then result in action, and it's got to result in um, people standing up for their rights. You know, you, you, you need to know that you have a right to privacy and then do the things that you need to do, do to, to enforce that. And in, if that includes taking the big companies to court, then there should be people and there should be NGOs that are willing to do that. So it's about awareness, taking action, and it's about the media actually writing about this as an issue. And it's, it's beginning to happen a little bit, but what the media don't do enough is write about media freedom as an issue that affects not only them, but society as a whole. And so what, you know, what Maya and what you, what you were saying that one of your biggest frustrations was when your case got a lot of attention, that's actually what you wanted to have all these dozens, if not hundreds, of others to get. And the media are just not picking up on these stories in the way that they should be. So the media need to be playing their role as well. So it's about awareness and it's about action and it's about making this the issue that it actually is. I fundamentally actually disagree. I don't think you can opt out anymore, and especially for journalists. How can you not be on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or wherever it is where the stories are, where your sources are, where you're getting your ideas, where you're doing your research. I think it's actually impossible to opt out and becoming increasingly impossible because modern cell phones all have geolocating, you know, geo-tracking location devices. Um, the internet of things brings a whole new realm to this, right? As your clothes and your jewelry and your watches become internet connected and geolocated, and where is that data being housed? It's not just about your communication, it's also about all of the metadata you're creating and the big data and how that data can be mined. And I think that we need to be thinking ahead about frameworks that think about metadata and about surveillance. And the fact, I mean, we might not need source protection anymore because the government can just go to its you know, go to the surveil its massive reams of data or, you know, private companies as well. So I just don't think opting out is really a legitimate option. But I think that there are initiatives, as I mentioned, the ranking digital rights, which is looking at some of these issues, trying to bring open so, you know, there is more transparency reporting by companies. The Global Network Initiative, which CPJ helped found, and it has members with, you know, Microsoft and um, Facebook and Google. Um, who are, you know, have adopted some sort of basic framework for some rights and they're doing these rights assessments and um, transparency reports, but we need not only transparency about government uh, requests and fulfillment, <clears throat> but also about how companies are using their terms of service and whether, you know, how they're using those to potentially restrict speech or um, what they're doing with the data. And I think, you know, we see this fundamental um, difference between Europe and the U.S. kind of in terms of privacy and where that division lies. So we're really, I think, at a new frontier. And I don't think you should kid yourself that the, US, that the Internet was developed as a space for free speech. It was developed by the military, and then it was promoted by universities as a way to, a way to you know, share information, and it was designed to be resilient. But there, you know, is no inherent, uh, you know, openness to the internet. We have to fight to keep that open and to make sure that it remains 
a global internet because we also see the balkanization of the internet um, and the fragmentation as you know Iran is trying to create its own internal internet, China, etc. And so, just yeah, don't kid yourself that that's. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, to build off of what both my colleagues were saying, I think there are two issues that can be addressed and should be addressed right now. Um, one is the fact that a lot of the spyware that is being used by oppressive regimes is coming sometimes from EU-based companies. And there needs to be regulation within the EU, both to say what can and cannot be sold to governments who commit human rights violations, but then also for accountability when they do sell that spyware. And so when we know that EU programs, EU spyware is being used in places like Bahrain, like Ethiopia, like Syria and so on, to track down activists and journalists and then torture them and put them in prison, those EU companies need to be held accountable as well. So we need mechanisms within the EU that are actually implemented because we do have an OECD complaint process within the EU, which we have made use of. But I think it needs to be something that's a lot stronger than that and a lot faster because if it takes three years to get an OECD complaint looked at and for the OECD committee to then say, yes, they did you know, breach a law, that's not fast enough when people are being arrested and thrown in prison and tortured. So I think definitely that's one thing we need to see, including the EU response. Um, when you know, people are being jailed and, and, and tortured and so on, we need the EU and other countries who say that freedom uh, and, and human rights and democracy are the cornerstone of their foreign policy to actually act on those principles and values. And you know, to actually take these up in their conversations with their allies and say, well, what you're doing is not okay. Uh, and therefore there to be consequences because it's the lack of accountability that allows for these violations to happen. And the other point that I wanted to make very quickly is also the double standards that we sometimes see in the mainstream media when covering issues of media freedom and the attack on journalists. It's very easy sometimes for certain media, media outlets to cover you know, a case in Iran or in Syria, but when it comes to the Gulf, for example, suddenly they don't really want to touch that case. And I think that also takes away some of the credibility in, in the process of protecting journalists and in the process of protecting press freedom, is that it needs to be applied to everyone equally. Um, I think, you know, we saw an amazing campaign for Peter, P Peter Grest and Hamid Fahmi in Egypt, but unfortunately we did not see the same thing for local Egyptian journalists who are also imprisoned and tortured and kept in prison still. And I think that's what needs to be changed. We need to see the same level of protection, the same level of attention being brought to all the different journalists around the world and without, without picking and choosing who should be protected and who should not. I also, I think we should just recognize that some of the governments that we are talking about, at least they're sitting here in this room listening and taking it. You know, and then there are other governments who never engage in these conversations. So, you know, thank you for, for being here and engaging on these issues. And I think that is important. Yes, um, unfortunately, we are about to finish this plenary. Um, thank you very much uh, for this great audience, but thank you very much for speakers. We are very lucky to have you here. And um, I just would like to finish this plenary with a quote of Khadija Ismailova, round composition, you know, always is very conservative and very good. Uh, she said when she got to know that one of the, her colleagues, investigative journalist Elmar Husseino, had been murdered in Azerbaijan, capital Baku, Ismailova said, they killed him at his doorstep, and the first thing I thought when I heard was, it is my responsibility too. It is my fault as well, because he was doing it alone. Thank you about it.